your great idea, even something you are very passionate about, may not be what the world needs. This is a seemingly bleak lesson, but one of the most important lessons that I learned as a youth in the process of completing my Eagle Scout service project. Your great idea might not be what the world needs. Because see, in 2008, I had a great idea. I loved the Roanoke Rescue Mission, a beacon of hope in my hometown since 1948. They provided shelter and healing, support services and transformation to countless people throughout their history who were experiencing homelessness and addiction and other crises that left them without options or hope. The Roanoke Rescue Mission restored hope and dignity in my hometown, and I knew that when it came time to complete my Eagle Scout service project, that this was the organization I wanted to help. An Eagle Scout service project is a very straightforward prompt and a very complicated process. It's the capstone of a youth's experience in the Boy Scouts. The Scout Handbook says, as a life scout, Plan, develop, and give leadership to others in a service project helpful to any religious institution, any school, or your community. That's the prompt. You have to complete this by the time you're 18, and you can't use your own money to make it happen. It has to be through fundraisers and generosity. The process was deeply complicated and one that required scouts to have a direct mentor and a board who supported and reviewed their process throughout. They often joked that you had to write your Eagle Scout proposal to be bus-proof, meaning that if you got hit by a bus tomorrow, one of your fellow scouts could pick up your binder and do every step of the project. It was an immense undertaking, and I knew that I wanted to dedicate that kind of energy to the Roanoke Rescue Mission. In fact, I saw an opportunity because around that time, the Rescue Mission had just opened a brand new separate shelter for women and children. And I had the idea to build a library because these kids, like me, deserved a chance to read and grow while they were going through one of the most tumultuous chapters of their life. I loved reading, and I couldn't imagine my life if I lost all my books and my opportunities to learn new things. So I wrote up a pitch. I sketched out some ideas, I ran things by my advisors, and I arranged a meeting with the rescue mission. I sat down in front of the desk of the volunteer director of the Roanoke Rescue Mission, and I told her what I was going to do. I was going to build shelves, and I, I had a plan for where I would go to collect these books, and I'd implement a whole system for cataloging and organizing the books so that they could be checked out. And I had talented friends who could paint, so if they just pointed me to a free room, then we'd make that space bright and beautiful for everyone who ever wanted to read and learn there. I was so proud of this idea, and I couldn't wait to get started. So I was absolutely floored when the director of the rescue mission looked at me and said, wow, that sounds like a great plan. We don't really need that. In fact, we actually already have a library, and it looks a lot like what you're describing. But, if you're still interested in working with the Roanoke Rescue Mission, let me tell you what we do need. Your great idea, even something you're very passionate about, may not be what the world needs. I'm so grateful that I had an opportunity to learn that lesson all those years ago, and I found myself right back there, slack-jawed in the rescue mission director's office as I read the story of David today. Now, we don't have as much to catch up on today as we did in last week's previously on the Bible, but there were still some important moments between 1 Samuel 1 and 2 Samuel 7. As we heard last week, the story begins with Hannah, who prays fervently for a child and vows to dedicate him to God if her prayers are answered. God grants her a son, Samuel, who grows up to become a prophet under the priest, Eli. But in the midst of this time, Israel is in disarray after the time of the judges, facing threats from the Philistines, and the people are demanding a king. But despite Samuel's faithful warnings to the people, God ultimately instructs Samuel to anoint Saul as the first king of Israel. Saul begins his reign with success, but... Soon he begins to disobey God, 
leading to his rejection as king and God's favor being withdrawn. Meanwhile, Samuel is sent by God to anoint David, a young shepherd, as the future king. David rises to prominence by defeating Goliath, the giant Philistine warrior, which wins him favor among the people, but it sparks a lot of jealousy in Saul. Saul is repeatedly trying to kill David, who flees and gathers a loyal band of followers around him. There are some tense and messy times where both Saul and David are claiming kingship of Israel, but after Saul's death in battle, David is anointed king over Judah, while, son, while Saul's son, Ishbosheth, tries to claim a hereditary line and briefly rules over the northern tribes. But eventually, David is able to unite all of Israel under his kingship. He conquers Jerusalem, makes it the capital, and brings the Ark of the Covenant there, establishing this city as the religious and political heart of Israel. So all of that brings us to today, where David is like a 16-year-old would-be Eagle Scout, sitting down before God with a great idea. David says, I have a nice house that I was able to build for myself, so I feel like I should build a house for God. It's a great idea, but God and the world around them didn't need it. Now, we can't fully know David's intentions from the text before us. I'm sure that there was a feeling of genuine love, of faithfulness, and empathy for God, probably paired with a little bit of guilt that David lived in such a big, nice house while like a spirit of altruism and love for the Roanoke Rescue Mission were David's driving factors as well. But if I'm being really honest, vulnerable, and repentant, I would also acknowledge that in my desire to do an Eagle Scout project, I had another vision in my mind. In the midst of this brightly painted and vibrant library that I held in my heart, I also imagined a shiny plaque that read, this library was donated by Alex Zuber, Troop 221, in completion of his Eagle Scout service project. And then I'd include something nice, like, a scout is reverent. On some level, I wanted my name to be up there, to be remembered for the good thing that I built. Well, we will hear next week of Solomon's temple, and I wonder if there was a deeper selfish longing for David's temple to be remembered through the generations. I wonder as well if there weren't reasons of power and prestige that guided David in wanting to centralize not only the government, but the presence of the living God in Jerusalem with him. For good or ill, this was David's great idea, and God didn't need it. So God speaks to David through the prophet Nathan. In the midst of this season that's been a whirlwind of transition and struggle, of battle and unification, of building and establishing, God decides to turn down the tempo, pump the brakes for David and his great ideas. There's actually an interesting little phenomenon in the Hebrew text today that deliberately slows down the tempo for the reader. There's very little punctuation within Hebrew texts, and a lot of it, when it is there, can be lost in translation, but there's some notable pauses in here, little signs that denote a need to take a breath. The Hebrew, as it's written, reads a little more like this in this section, but it came to pass, comma, that same night, comma, the word, comma, of the Lord, comma, came to Nathan, comma, go and tell my servant David, colon, comma, hybrid, because Hebrew doesn't really have a lot of punctuation, it's weird. Thus says the Lord, colon, comma, hybrid, are you the one to build me a house to live in? The text itself gives us an opportunity to pump the brakes, to read the commas, to take a breath, and to join David in doing the thing that he should have been doing from the beginning. Listen. 
This was the mistake that David and I shared in our desire to do the right thing. We didn't listen first. We rolled in with our good ideas and good intentions. And there was nothing wrong with the idea. But it wasn't what God needed. And that's okay. God made it clear to David and Nathan that God desired to be mobile, to be among the people, and that God was in no way inhibited or slighted by being in a tent. Instead, God needed David to trust in God's provision and power. For David himself to be among and lead the people with equity and to find hope not in a building, but in a family. Ironically, the Eagle Project that I ended up doing for the rescue mission involved building 16 foldable and durable building facades, like set designs, to look like everyday buildings in a town because they wanted to revamp their immersive educational experience called Poverty Town, where folks learned what it was like to live on the margins for a simulated month. They wanted to make their experience mobile. They wanted to teach the community about poverty and the need for their support, not from their own building, but on the road and among them. Huh. So David wanted to build God a house, and instead God gave him a house. where God's very name would live among those who keep God's law. David thought that his security and the security of his nation lived in the buildings that he could construct. But God showed him that his security, his life, his future, lived in the people, among them and in the hope that they shared, rather than inside any building they could build together. Because David never built his own house to begin with. It was a gift from God. And the future of this nation would always be tied to the people, the people that they served and not the things that they built. David's story today begs the question of each of us about whether or not we are hitting the brakes, reading the commas, taking a breath, and truly listening to our God. We may have great ideas, but if they don't come first from our hearts that are listening to our God and discerning of God's call, then they may be merely reflections of our own interests. God is still to be found among the people, in the ones who faithfully listen with us and help us to see and discern God's call. It's not easy work, but it's faithful. And this work can only be done together as one people united in God's word. It begins with humility and recognizing that every good gift comes from God and our future does not rest in stone, but in the hearts of all who carry God's hope into this world. We've seen this own thing happen across our 175 years of history as a congregation. Consider our old church building on Main Street. The steeple is gone, and it's now called Smoker's Paradise. This does not grieve me. Well, a little bit, because as Terry noted in our wonderful history book, uh, there was a really missed opportunity there to call it uh, Holy Smokes. But beyond the puns <laughs> that were missed, I'm not troubled. Because God's people have carried on God's presence here. And who knows what the next 175 years will hold. Because again, our future, like David's, is held in the hearts of God's people and not in even the beautiful stone around us. Pump the brakes, read the commas, take a breath, open even your great ideas that God is forming them. Listen well with faith and hope. God's future is in you. God's future is you. It lives not in a house, 
but in your heart. Amen.